CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. I am Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with my usual co-host, Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. Perhaps he has some updates for us on any uh, mergers or acquisitions uh, regarding his, uh, his corporation. Uh, and uh, joining us from the hop here, it is Zig Fracassi, longtime friend of Tim Graham. I guess friend of the show. He's been on a couple of times. We should have him on more often, quite frankly. And uh, Zig, thanks for coming on, man. Timmy, always great to be with you. Jonas, how are you, brother? Good. Good to see you. You too. Niagara Catholic's finest. Hall yes. of Famer. Yes, school that's not even open anymore, but I digress. You're in the Hall of Fame, though. I am. Um, and the quick little story, I don't know if I told this the last time, but the week I was supposed to get my honor, they closed the school. <laughs> I You can't make that up. I mean, I feel bad because, gosh, there's a lot of good uh, education from that uh, institution, but unfortunately... You know, being around Western New York, Tim, private education, it's almost like more to go there than it would be like the NCCC or ECC or any of those other schools. So it was a shame, but I had a great four years there. Well, you and Jonah can talk about uh, what happens up in Niagara County. Jonah does a lot of writing for the Niagara Gazette, as you know, and uh, maybe we'll talk about uh, Niagara basketball some other episode because we have to get into – or NCCC for that matter, former sponsor of uh, the Tim Graham show when it was on terrestrial radio. Ah. NCCC, also a friend of a friend of the show. I'm also a distinguished alumni of them now. Right on. Yeah. So I hope I don't close that school. <laughs> That's a revenue stream for us. And we hope for that also. Yeah. Oh, oh, breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> Zig, what are your thoughts uh, on, let's start with the Bills, of course. Uh, sure. Josh Allen in the walking boot after the game. That is a manifestation of all of Bills' fears, Bills' fans' fears also. I guess the Bills, one Bills drive too. Uh, since they drafted this guy and everybody realized that, hey, this guy runs the ball pretty well and uh, we like to run him a lot, uh, especially since our running backs haven't stepped forward and, and taken that load away. Uh, that if we need to win, uh, Josh Allen's going to have to run the ball. And, of course, he gets injured. Uh, he's been sturdy for a long time in his career, but I think in the back of everyone's minds, when he takes off down the, down the field, you're, you're thinking slide or get out of bounds exactly. or don't take that extra hit. Uh, and now here he is uh, in the walking boot. Perhaps he's going to play because walking boots can just be a precaution. that They happen a lot after a game uh, just so he doesn't uh, do anything – extra uh, to, to hurt it on the flight or walking up the stairs, getting off the plane or whatever. Uh, but here we have an injured Josh Allen uh, going up against the Carolina Panthers, a game that should be easy to win, but it's borderline must win for, for a team that is on the edge of the playoffs. What's, what's your take here, Zig? Tim, I agree with you. And again, he's a wonderful athlete. There's no question about it, but, you got to be able to run the ball and they haven't done that on a consistent basis throughout, you know, I, you'd have thought that a uh, single Terry would have been more of a back. I know when they brought Brita into the lineup that they gave him a little bit of a boost, but you know, that could also be tied in with inconsistent play on the offensive line. So when you start running Josh Allen, then you risk uh, increased injury and as wonderfully talented as he is, Timmy makes his millions throwing the ball, getting the ball to digs, getting the ball to knocks and everything like that. So to your point, uh, they've been too up and down for my taste this year. I, I had a fear that maybe 
the uh, inconsistencies, maybe the handling of the success from the prior year could come back to hurt them, but they're still in the final spot in the AFC, and also three of the last four games at home, three of the last four games against teams below 500. So you would think 10 and 7 would probably be enough to get them in because I don't think I don't think they're going to beat the Patriots the second time they play them in Foxborough. So you got to hope that Josh Allen is okay and you also got to, you know, hope, have some help on that uh, on both lines too because Tampa took it at him on that four net run for the touchdown. We all know what happened, you know, 220 yards on the Monday night before and you also got to be able to run the ball, and it comes down to play at the line of scrimmage. And if you don't get either, you're not going to go very far in the playoffs. And let's reset uh, what is uh, at hand here for the Buffalo Bills, uh, for those who may not have memorized these last four weeks, uh, versus Carolina at home, at the New England Patriots the day after Christmas, and then at home against the Atlanta Falcons, at home against the New York Jets, Uh, And I think that the New York Jets, uh, as the opponent in the regular season finale, when that schedule came out, uh, fans looked at that game as a wonderful uh, bit of scheduling that would allow the Bills to rest their starters heading into the playoffs. But I don't think that that is uh, something that they can afford to do. They're probably going to have to win that game. They need to make sure of it, like you say, Zig, to get to 10 and 7. Uh, and then uh, just to set up the standings, so the Bills are in the seventh spot at seven and six. So the Indianapolis Colts are sixth uh, at seven and six, but have that tiebreaker with the head-to-head uh, victory. But then there are three teams with the same record not in the playoff bracket right now because of different tiebreakers, and we know how how dicey those can get. So the Cleveland Browns, Cincinnati Bengals, Denver Broncos, also all at seven and six. The Pittsburgh Steelers at six, six, and one. So they're also right in there. Uh, That's a tight, tight race. And it's just amazing to think that two months ago, after that victory over Kansas city, the last time the bills won consecutive games, by the way, uh, that they were the super bowl favorites in Las Vegas. And now they're eighth on that list. Uh, And um, below their, their odds, uh, that they had when they walked into the season. So Zig, you, you think that when you take a look at the AFC, how worried should the bills and their fans be that they don't make it at all? I think there's a little bit of a concern, but I, here's what I would say again to, you know, the last four games, a little brief synopsis. Cam Newton's lost his last 11 straight games as Carolina starter dating back to 2018. And there's a belief they may have checked out already. Like I says, I think New England, I don't think they win that one, especially up in Foxborough. Atlanta is a fringe playoff team, although they're still technically in it. And then the Jets are going to be looking ahead to 2022. But then if you look around Cleveland, now they had what a host of players go on COVID on Tuesday including Jarvis Landry, and they've been up and down. So, you know, and I think they've got, they still have games inside their own division. So they in Cincinnati may cancel themselves out. And to me, just when you think that you've got Cincy figured out with those big wins over Baltimore and Pittsburgh, they lay eggs against the Chargers. And then uh, in overtime this past week against San Francisco. So they're a tough read. Denver might be kind of the team that maybe sneaks up on people. Because they, to me, they have a playoff, the Super Bowl caliber defense, but I'm not sold on Bridgewater long term. But I think it's one of these things. You, you've got the position right there. Again, they are the seventh spot in the AFC, and again, those three games at home are very, very important. I think if they hold serve, borrowing a tennis term, I think they'll be fine. But it shouldn't have gotten to this point. Why do you think it has gotten to this point, other than the fact that they can't win consecutive games uh, and their record is whatever it is, four and four and six, or I can't, I'd have to go back and look, but they, they're two games below 500 since beating uh, the Chiefs. What is it about their, their X's and O's or, or their, their coaching or, or what, what is it that stands out to you, Zig? Well, I think for one, the Jacksonville loss was bad. I mean, you, me, and Jonas and like eight other people from my apartment complex could probably go down there and put 20 on them if 
without practice. So to me, that's a sign of a team that's, you know, maybe not focused like they should be. So that's to me a problem. Uh, obviously, you've had uh, injuries on both lines. Star, you know, very underrated defensive performer. When he's not in there, then I think other teams can kind of take liberties. I know what Feliciano has been hurt on that offensive line, too. May not be the biggest name, but those big, not big names, Tim, they make the holes for the ground game and protect Josh. So I think there's been inconsistencies there. Um, you, you wonder, and again, I'm just looking at this from the outside looking in, but people I, I talk to and reading people like yourself, you got to wonder maybe if things are simpatico or not simpatico between Dayball and, and, you know, Sean McDermott in terms of play calling and everything like that. So I think there's just a multitude of things to look at. And like I said before, too, you know, the Bills were the flavor of the month in the offseason, the ascending team that's going to give Mahomes and company, you know, the, the, the push as far as the AFC. But it's how you handle that adversity. And they're going through it right now. And, you know, are they still united? Are they, is this going to become a house uh, divided, so to speak? So this is that adversity now. But if they run the table or at least go three out of four, get into the playoffs, and make a run, then maybe all sins are forgiven. If there is a game or two where they can't take their foot off the accelerator, I could see Atlanta maybe being that game. And, of course, they're going to want to beat New England because there is an outside shot that they can still win the division that way. Um, Josh Allen's probably going to have to keep running the ball. And what you have to wonder – and, and, and Bruce Arians even made the comment uh, after the game on Sunday um, that how much he marveled at, at Josh Allen, says he's Cam Newton but with a better arm. <laughs> uh, but he criticized the Bills, saying, I don't think I would leave my quarterback vulnerable as much as they have. But, you know, I guess he's like, whatever, you know, whatever floats your boat. Um, but if you have four more games in which he's going to have to run the ball, uh, based on what we've seen out of this Bills offense, that that's, stands to reason. Uh, then what kind of shape is he going to be in come playoff time? I mean, can you, if, if they could theoretically, I think it's quite fathomable to see the bills as you know, wearing themselves out just to get in there. Exactly. That's a great point. And, you know, you look at the numbers, I mean, single Terry's average in terms of yards per carry is just over four, but then you've got Moss and Brita each under four. And generally, a successful team's one that can run the ball average four to four and a half yards per carry. I know that's when Todd Haley and I do the show, the former Chiefs head coach, he always talked about his dad, the legendary Steelers executive, would tell him, if you're averaging four and a half yards per pop, then generally you're doing pretty well. But again, I, I agree with Bruce Arians 100%. Um, you know, you've, you've got to be able to at least try to run the ball as much as you can. Or, Timmy, if you even see it before, the, one of their opponents, Atlanta, they might be onto something now where Cordero Patterson has had his career revived. This actually happened in New England under Belichick. But they decided to use him now in the backfield and also have that threat of a receiver. If that's something Dayball and them have to do over the last few games, maybe use Beasley or Diggs in that role as a part-time runner, they might want to consider that too, you know, and that kind of consideration too. So that's where I think you could take some pressure off Josh Allen. If you even pass the ball disguised though, as a run, like you would when you're going to see Patterson there in a few weeks for Atlanta, that's maybe what these teams are going to have to start doing now. If, uh, if the bills have something like that, that they've been working on, you know, reminiscent of the 2008 Miami Dolphins that all of a sudden yeah. go, go into Foxborough and spring the Wildcat. And people That's are like, right. where did this come from? Right. If the Bills have something like that in their back pocket, it's about time to use it. Exactly. Uh, because by, by the time you get to the playoffs, it might be too late. Hey, whatever floats the boat, man, whatever gets you there, you know. So, What, what do you think about the possibility of giving Josh Allen a week off to get healthy and play a Mitchell Trubisky this Sunday. Yeah, I don't know that they can afford it. 
Uh, but it could be a situation where he plays with the idea of, okay, if we can get up and we can throttle these guys, then Trubisky can play the second half or something like that. But you see how these coaches operate. They, they generally don't feel comfortable with a win until it's, you know, a possession or or so into the fourth quarter. I think Um, to Jonas's point, had they won last week, that might've been a consideration, but they didn't win. So now I'm with Tim. They, they've got to play Josh. So you're hoping a 50% Josh Allen is better than 100% Mitch Trubisky, even if your opponent is Carolina. Is that the case, though? I, I don't know if, you know, if it, I, maybe it is. Maybe it is. But the Bills are supposed to be high on Mitch Trubisky is at least one of the higher paid backup quarterbacks. I don't know if he's the best backup quarterback, but he's one of the better backup quarterbacks. I mean, isn't this why he's on the team to, to win you a game when your all pro quarterback is not uh, at his best? Mitchell Trubisky should be able to beat the Carolina Panthers. Right. The, that's as, right. That's so fair to say. Jonah yes. raises a great point there. Um, yeah, this I could think it be depends the on to... the injury and how much one game of rest would make Josh Allen. Or do they play both the on Sunday? Game. That could happen too. Yeah, get Josh out of the game as quick as you can. And get that lead. I, what a, about the Bills regarding, you know, Zig, I know it gets tricky uh, when you're talking about Bills fans because they live and die with this team. And, and Jonah and I were talking about it uh, before you joined uh, the, the Zoom here. Um, and I wrote about it from my uh, column down in Tampa in which the, this this game against the Buccaneers – if you are a cynic or a skeptic, and there are a lot of people out there who are saying fire Sean McDermott already, oh boy, yeah. uh, you know, there's all there's, you know, how fans are. Um, they don't like what they see. Uh, they want being on the hot seat. Uh, it's whatever. There's all kinds of reasons you can come up with to be upset with the bills that what that you were proven correct. You could find any kind of material from, from that game to, to back your stance that this team is not good enough. Or if you are the most optimistic of Bills fans who thinks they can win the Super Bowl, there was plenty of material from that game to support your case that, yes, this team did some great things against the defending Super Bowl champs and one of the best teams in the NFL. In fact, the new favorite to win it again, the Buccaneers now in, in Vegas are, are the favorites. Uh, and, and, and the favorite to win the MVP at quarterback, Tom Brady. Uh, so you have whatever you want to, whatever you want to see. It's like a Rorschach test. Whatever it is you want to see out of that Bills, uh, I guess where um, if you could advise Bills fans, <laughs> Zig, as to uh, how they how they should uh, handle uh, their uh, their mental well being here at the holidays when things are stressful. Oh yeah, uh, should the Bills be one of those uh, things that uh, add to your stress? They can be, but I think it's because there's so much love and uh, compassion and, you know, so much energy for the team. And we saw, you know, they've been a playoff team uh, in recent seasons. So I think there's a good enough um, window there. And if I'm also an optimist too, you know, they got, they got their doors blown off in the first 30 minutes last week. It looked as though the proverbial wheels were coming off the, the car here, so to speak, but, Instead of quitting, instead of backbiting, they got back into a rhythm in this game and then ultimately forced the overtime. So to me, that says there is no discord. There is no rift in the locker room. The fact of the matter is they fought to get to within, and had they cashed in on that first possession, we maybe have you know a different change of mind. So, And also, too, to that Monday night game, yes, they got gashed all over the place, but it was still – less than a touchdown margin of victory here. So it's not like they're not close enough to win these games. They just got to get over that hump, do what they do best. And, you know, obviously defense, they miss Trey White. You know, that's a big loss in that secondary too. And I mentioned Starr not being in there, really disrupts that defensive line. So, again, this is where these last four games – They have to take care of business in three of them and don't look down at your opponent, even the ones that you think you should beat because they think they still have a chance 
for the playoffs, too, except for the Jets. Those other teams have chances for the playoffs, too. So you have to be at your best, minus whatever personnel you don't have, and you can't get last year back into the thought process. This is a new year, new adversities. You play through what you got, too. And I'm sure also, too, Timmy, I know your old paper there, the news had an interesting piece the other day about guys getting scratched, you know, like uh, Ford and Moss and Basham. I mean, these are guys being drafted, too. So now he may hold a little bit of the blame here for, well, this is your draft. These are supposed to be guys that you could count on when your injuries come in and then that they're healthy scratches. You know, that's another layer to all this, too, that guys you think are your good reserves, they're not playing. Why is that? So a lot of layers, but to answer your question from a long term, just focus on the week at hand, and you know you're still in the playoffs. Just take care of business, and if you don't lose, you won't lose out on that spot. Yeah, you raise a great point uh, regarding uh, the uh, selections by Brandon Bean that haven't panned out, and I'll even intensify your sentiment there and say that guys like Cody Ford and Boogie Basham and and Zach Moss, those are areas of need, of critical need, and, and right. they should be maybe doing more than filling in as backups. That's they right. should probably be, you know, um, flexing as, as starters right now, you know, you know yeah. second and third round picks. Yeah, those are your areas of need. You're absolutely right. I mean, I love Moss coming out of Utah. He was one of the underrated backs, but sometimes they, this guy's either not fast enough or they just can't make that transition fast enough to bash him loved him out of out of wake forest but you know again it's that transition to the pros it could be kind of tough well and the bills are searching for it a little bit in certain spots in the line and in the running game yeah. there have been games when zach moss was the lead ball carrier cody ford has started boogie basham has been in and out of the lineup so this far into the season they're still figuring out who really is their you know top 45 and, and what they're rotation should be well, John the injury to John Feliciano I think was a big domino that really Absolutely. hurt that offensive line and and he was active uh on Sunday but only on special teams so his calf injury clearly isn't ready uh or or healed enough for him to be back there in the lineup of course you you don't want John Feliciano in his first game back in several weeks to have the responsibility of blocking and Dominican Sue and Vita Via, and be like, "Hey, welcome back to the lineup, John." You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe it's uh, maybe let somebody else uh, who's been playing uh, handle that. But uh, he was dressed. Uh, that's a good sign moving forward. Uh, hopefully, he can make a big difference there. Ike Butker. Didn't, didn't can, this happen uh, last year? His first game back off injury, he either rotated or didn't play. It was a little more surprising when it happened. I think a year ago. Right. Well, then, uh, may, and I might be getting Mitch Morse mixed up too. You know, he came back and maybe stayed at center, even though Mitch Morse yeah, was healthy. Yeah, I might and, have and that inverted too. Right. Right. Um, Zig, uh, here's a a thing that you hear, especially from callers uh, in your years uh, hosting uh, shows on WNSA, and I, I know that uh, in your role at Sirius XM, um, you know, anytime you uh, you're talking to people, uh, fans who are upset, the officiating comes up. Oh, yeah. uh, that was a big problem uh, with the Bills, and uh, you know, fans are raw about some of the calls that either were or were not made. Uh, Stephon Diggs interfered with. Um, did Dane Jackson really impede uh, Rob Gronkowski, or maybe it was Mike Evans on that particular one? The move now from receivers when a, a defensive back is facing them is to practically just tackle the defensive back, draw him, bring him down to the ground with you, and, and it shows that Exactly. Then becomes interference. I get personally worn out by officiating criticism because it's a variable. Um, I do not believe that there is an agenda or any kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's not a conspiracy to keep the bills uh, from winning the game. Uh, but it is legitimate there in the sense that some calls are missed and a lot of people are down on the officiating this year. Um, how do you come away from, from that game? And especially after we're now three months into the NFL season, there have been a lot of, there has been a lot of discussion regarding the officiating this year, whether it's the taunting calls or, you know, the, the defense, that pass interference is getting more and more difficult to adjudicate. Uh, I, I guess 
give it, give us the Zig Fracassi take on officiating. Oh boy. I don't know if we have enough time for the rest of the show. No, I, I would, and this say, is NFL officiating Zig. Let's, oh, let's just not, let's yeah. not give ourselves migraines and talk about NHL. officiating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We don't want that. Um, listen, they have a tough job to do you and I and Jonas all know that. Um, and you know, there was the like Thanksgiving day. I'm sure Anthony Brown of the Cowboys doesn't want to see another flag for the rest of his life. He got nailed. The guy was didn't have a flag against him all year, and then all of a sudden there's four against him on the Raiders by the Raiders on Thanksgiving Day. And the last one I thought was really uh, egregious. And, and it comes back too, Timmy, to where these guys coming out of college, you're also wondering – how they're taught in defending the pass because I see more and more in my older years where instead of the back pedal and trying to stay with the receiver, it's almost as if they're trained to basically just run the ball down. If they look at the receiver's eyes while they're chasing them, put the arms up, and then hopefully they defend the pass that way. So I think maybe there's a grander thing in play there. It's almost like to the you know, linemen not being able to block because everything in college is the RPO or the quarterback not taking snaps under center. So where I'm going on that discussion is when it's in college like that to try to transfer that to the pros, I think maybe the technique's not being taught. That's where you're seeing more of these pass interference calls. I don't know if you remember a game, I think it was earlier this year, the Colts were playing the 49ers. You know what Indy's best offense was, Tim? Throw the ball deep because San Francisco's past defenders would ultimately draw interference. So that's where the problem is. I, I think it's the technique. And then when you see the contact, as obvious as it is, those downfield judges and the back judge, everything like that, they have no choice but to throw the flag. So, yeah, it's a problem. And I think part of it also is brought on because of the, the, the Thursday night games. I think the mental sharpness is not there. The physical sharpness is not there. So that's a cumulative effect. So in other words, I think everything that I just brought up contributes to having more of these penalties called. So it's a slippery slope, and they do a good job under the circumstances. But there are games, like when Sheffers ref referees, or I call them flags boger, Jerome boger, you're guaranteed to get at least a dozen to 14 flags in every game that he calls. So I think there's, there is a little bit of blame on all the sides here. Should we revisit being able to challenge pass interference penalties? That didn't really work in the first experiment, but it seems like just going by the results of the Bills game, that that might have been a, a solution to some of those plays. It, it could, Jonas, but my gosh, then, man, you might have like four, four-and-a-half-hour games after that. So... Boy, that one's tricky. I don't know if they'll ever go back to doing that, but again, it's just got to be so, to me, it's just got to be so egregious. If the defender takes the receiver down or there's clear contact, then it has to be called. But if there's two guys going for a ball, more often than not, I would err on not calling it because there's two guys fighting for the ball. One thing I want to mention regarding Stefan Diggs, and again, this isn't some kind, this isn't something I'm reporting with some with inside information or a source or anything, just something to consider based on my observation and somebody who's been following football for a long time. Uh, on the particular no call, uh, the name of the defensive back is, is escaping me, but in which uh, the, the, uh, the photos were going around of his jersey being pulled from behind rather clearly. The guy was practically uh, water skiing. Um, <laughs> but I do want to point out that earlier on that play, Stefan Diggs had a handful of his jersey uh, up around the chest. And right. a lot of times when officials see that and, a, and it becomes goose and gander type situation where, okay, you've done that, whether it's hand fighting or pushing off or whatever, and then – you don't get the call because you you're doing it too. Um, so obviously there was a great, you, you take the still photo and it, and it becomes egregious. But the other thing I've been noticing about Stefan Diggs, uh, and a lot of receivers do this too, but I wonder if he's getting a reputation of the guy begging for the call too much mm. because on that mm -hmm. particular play, mm -hmm. 
The ball was still in the air. He had a chance to make the play, and he is turning over his shoulder and throwing his hands up to say, aren't you going to call that? And he still had a chance. The ball hadn't gotten there yet. So rather than asking or begging for the call, how about completing the catch? And that's not the first time he's done that. He's done that a, a handful of times this year. And so, again, is that a defense for the official later on in the game um, to not throw the flag when it was a, a clear pass interference? I don't know. But maybe in the heat of that moment, it's at least in the official's mind that this guy dives he's, or he he's begs, whining again. Or, yeah. yeah. And at least wait till the play's over before asking for the, the penalty. He's actually doing it while the play's still live. And well, I think like a, that's, that's a problem. It's like a basketball concept of finishing through the contact, that if you go in there trying to draw fouls, you actually get more free throws by just trying to score and getting fouled than trying to go in there and jumping into defenders and, and get fouled. Sometimes the NBA got a little off the beaten path with how they officiated and they've cleaned it up. But I thought that too with Stefan Diggs, that he could have went and caught the ball, and if he was maybe more focused on catching the ball, he might have been more likely to get the pass interference penalty too. In other words, yeah, put more of your energy into trying to catch the ball than, you know, complaining about it. And I think yeah. Tim's on to he something. He gave up too. on the play. When, right. you turn it, when you turn your focus, even for two seconds, or a, let's say it's a half a second, I, this stuff happens fast. If, if the thought in his mind was, I need to tell the ref I'm getting interfered with right here, then you've given up on the play. Right. The whistle hasn't blown yet. The ball's still in the air. You have a chance to make the catch, but he has turned his, he's actually shifted his momentum to look at the ref to throw it. And then he's like, oh, I guess I'll try to make the, well, by then it's too late. And uh, and, 22 seconds left. And you got to think the ref might not want to make that call and put the ball on the one yard line. That's right. That happens. Yeah. That's a big basketball thing too, right? The, it is, the, but I think it happens in, the in football, too. I think uh, on Hail Marys, you never see a pass interference called on that. Well, I think they've – just the basketball for a second, I think they've tried to clean that up like – They uh, have. Ha- yeah, like Harden was most notable, the one for they, you know, step back, try to three, and then lunge himself into the defender and draw all sorts of fouls, but I digress. And they've done a good job, which makes me think the NFL, there probably is a solution – in the way that they coach the and grade the officials and the emphasis and what they do in the off season. But it just seems like every year there's a new problem with the way football is officiated or interpreting the rules. And they never really get ahead of it to where the fans look at it and think this game is being called the way we think it should be. Zig, while we have you, I want to shift over to the national hockey league. Uh, you follow it uh, probably closer than you do the NFL. Uh, just based on my my knowledge of you and going back 25 years to Las Vegas and, and oh, yeah. at International Hockey League games at Thomas and Mack Center. The Thunder. Um, what are your thoughts on the Sabres? Um, I'll just leave it at that rather than load up the question. <laughs> uh, still a work in progress, but gosh, you almost want to say – they stink with a purpose now. And, and what I mean by that is <laughs> what, what I mean by that is You're I, right. That should be put on the highlight video. Oh, did we, we lost Zig. I thought he was just thinking about making a really good point. <laughs> we, we, lost, we lost Zig's feed. Well, maybe we can edit this in. I think stink with a purpose should be the new name of this podcast. <laughs> He's right. They do stink with a purpose. Interesting to see what they do at goaltending. Uh, Uka Pekka Lukanen is getting the start uh, tonight. And then uh, Malcolm row, right? Subban is, is uh, back. So uh, Dell was sent down to Rochester. Uka Pekka Lukanen is playing hey, very so, well. Cl- yeah, Zig, I mean, you're back. We lost you. Oh, I'm sorry. Here. Am I there? You, been, you were talking for a good 30 seconds. Yeah, we there. missed all of that. We missed <laughs> oh, everything. So you missed go, that- start. You said they stink with a purpose, and then we lost you. Okay. Maybe maybe it shook the internet so much that I said that. But in, in all seriousness, um, what I mean by that is they had more – they had malcontents, a lot of high-priced veterans that I think you needed to weed out of. Now you've got guys, and I was mentioning Middlestad, who I think is a nice talent but unfortunately can't stay on the ice. Cousins is a guy that I really like. Uh, Thompson, the kid they got in the Ryan O'Reilly trade with St. Louis, he's becoming a sniper for him. Uh, Okposo, 
Good to see him back on the ice. He's one of those veteran guys to me that I think needs to be a, a leader. Um, then obviously defense, you know, everybody was sh- shelling Darlene the other day, but the fact was he tagged up on what should have been that tying goal against the Rangers. Cause I'm like, why is everybody killing him? To me, it looked like he tagged up on the play. So the play should have been onside and the goal should have counted And the NHL, even admit they screwed up there. So he, he's at his growing pains. Um, you know, they're, they're a younger team. There's no question about it. Uh, UPL, is he going to be their franchise goalie? So I think Donnie's got them playing hard. I, I really do. But it's unfortunate they are in arguably the toughest division in the NHL because you got Florida, Tampa, Toronto, uh, Boston, even as the, not as good as they are. They're still formidable. I think Detroit's getting a lot better, too. So I think things are on the uptick a little bit for the Sabres, but it's one of these things yet where – uh, there's going to be more pain, and unfortunately, it's going to be, what, 11 straight years now they're going to miss the playoffs, but hopefully they finally got their coach in place. I like Renato a lot, and, and the GM there, Kevin Adams, real sharp guy, got to know him from my time up in Buffalo. So if he's allowed to make some moves, which, by the way, that Eichel trade to get Vegas's top prospect and the Syracuse kid, Tuck, that's a nice haul. For a guy like Jack Eichel, a guy who doesn't want to play for your franchise anymore, I thought the Sabres did very well in that trade. Yeah, but Zig, you know, uh, you know, similar to the Ryan O'Reilly trade in which uh, fans have uh, selective amnesia, uh, they wanted him gone, and they were glad he was gone until Jimmy, he started playing he, he, well. He quitted. He quit. He did. He did. And, and yeah. you can argue that so did Eichel, but you know what's going to happen. If he ends up playing well for Las Vegas – Oh, they're yeah. going to hate the trade and Kevin, they're going to want Kevin Adams gone for not getting more. <laughs> and we already have heard the reports of Jack Eichel looking pretty good and he's skating already. And, uh, and he's being considered for the U S Olympic team. If he's healthy enough, um, uh, you know how it's going to go. I lived there. I've lived it. I know all about it, but again, then though, what happens if Kevin gives, Jack the approval to get his surgery and God forbid it didn't work out. You know, I mean, it is what it is and it's appropriate. Eichel's in Vegas because Timmy, as you know, you know, maybe that back surgery is akin to a heart eight. You don't know how it's going to turn out, but it looks as though it's, <laughs> it looks as though it's turned out pretty well. And I, I'm hoping to see Jack Eichel on the ice before too long. Cause I think he is a, is a player. And, 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 you know, it's another thing too, to be drafted that high, and also have the shoulders of your franchise with the losing, which he didn't do at Boston University. When that starts getting to you and you're a young guy and you're a captain, you're the face of the franchise, you don't have much help around you, that hurts. And also, oh, by the way, who was the pick before him? Who, by the way, played his junior hockey in Erie? You don't think Sabres fans are longing for the what if we wound up with Connor too, so... I think to Eichel, that might have been a little unfair, too. But now that we see that that surgery seems to have been a success and he's healing at a quick rate, if the Sabres knew that that was going to be the outcome, would they have been better off allowing him to get the surgery and then having a healthy Jack Eichel to trade? Would they have gotten more, do you think? Ooh, that's a really good question. But I, I think, Jonas, they're in, the, they're in the scenario then that if it didn't, then you get nothing for him. So... It literally is, it, it was a risk, but could they have been maybe a little more prudent to that or a little more patient or a little more open to other doctors solicited multi opinions? That's where I think if they would have said, you know, eight, of, eight out of nine, nine out of 10 would have said, we think this surgery will do well for Jack. Then maybe I would have held on to him and worked the trade that way. But it is what it is. They also would have looked more compassionate treating Jack Fair like enough. Or as I a think you're right. Person and less of a trade asset. Fair and enough. I think that Eichel's situation where it will have uh, a, where, where it will resonate is in the next collective bargaining agreement mm-hmm. uh, where this situation probably won't happen again because uh, players are going to fight for more. Uh, rights regarding what is done to their body or what they want to have done in terms of a major surgery rather than being um, 
you can, however you want to look at it, holding a team hostage or the team holding the player hostage. Uh, but it, it created a standoff that uh, the, the collective bargaining agreement can address for, uh, for future considerations. Um, Zig, what else do you want to talk about? Anything else about Western New York? You're, you're a native. Uh, oh, let me ask you this. Sure. You're, a, you're a native of Niagara Falls and you know the area. What's your take on the Bills Stadium? Where would you want to see this built? You're familiar with the discussion. Oh, absolutely. And what is I think they're still targeting what the area by ECC South, if I'm not mistaken. Right, right across so, the street on Abbott Road from the current right. stadium or downtown by the Perry Projects slash uh, Old First Ward um, down off of South Park Avenue. Yeah, not far from where the arena is. To me, I, I would want it downtown because then this way, you get more people back into the downtown area. Uh, you know, Orchard Park, even from Niagara Falls, is a little bit of a hike. So to me, put it downtown, maybe pump in a little, you know, economic vitality to the area, maybe have more people go in there. And then ultimately, I don't know if they're going to decide to put a roof on it, which they should. Then you start getting concerts over there. You start getting uh, events and things like this around there. If it's up to me, Timmy, and, I, and again, I'm old enough to remember when they first built the thing and there had been talk it was going to be downtown, but Mr. Wilson decided to go out to Orchard Park because it was the cheapest parcel of land that he could get. And by the way, I was actually at that first regular season game in 73 against the Jets, but as I digress, I would prefer to see the game down or the stadium downtown and give it a little more vitality. What about downtown Niagara Falls? It's been oh, suggested geez. in the past, although it seems to have been ruled out for traffic yeah. reasons. Yeah, Jonas, I love – I'm from Niagara Falls, and although I, I got to admit that that area, unlike at least Buffalo downtown and some of the other areas of western New York, they have not experienced the uh, sort of almost renaissance, if you will. At least Buffalo became like this, you know, medical – Haven and all this, and they redid downtown and everything. Niagara Falls is a pit. I, I, I can't, I can't be any more blunt than that. I would not put the stadium there. I think that they should put it next to Sal Magley Stadium. And the <laughs> synergies, the synergies between those two stadiums and the events, it would create a little sports village would would crop up because you'd have all the baseball dates in the summer and, uh, and then the football in the winter. Yeah. But the, the Hyde park Boulevard would be unbelievably <laughs> bad, man. Uh, I think Manning back. You could Jim, make an argument for downtown Niagara Falls, Jim Kelly and some of the people he's been working with over the years when they were trying to buy the team favored that, but Roger the, traffic, Trevino. the traffic going over the grand Island bridge and, and coming the other way, right. Oh. by the border it seemed to be the deal breaker on that. Yeah, absolutely. Johnny Bench once played at the uh, what's now Sal Magley Stadium. So, Jonah, you had uh, you had another uh, Sabres question for Zig. I did. When we were talking. I wanted to ask Zig, being that he follows the Bruins as closely as he does, if he thinks the Sabres aired and not re-signing Linus Allmark, would he could he be have been the franchise goaltender that the Sabres are looking for, or at least the right goaltender for this current team at in the next couple seasons. Very good question. Uh, and in fact, now uh, with Tuka Rask actually skating with the team as their emergency goaltender, there's a belief that he may come back now. So that becomes, and again, I know this is a Buffalo show, but from a Boston standpoint, now you would have three goalies. Swayman's been good. Allmark has started to become very good. Uh, so you got a little bit of an issue there. But to answer your question, I think it became time for Buffalo to pull the cord on Allmark just simply because of the health concerns of the past. And obviously they think the world of UPL. So how much do you want to spend on a goalie? Can you trust that goalie to stay healthy? That's where I think they probably saved a few bucks at the same time too. So that's why I think they decided there. Allmark's good and he's been good now for Boston, but health. It's been a big thing for him, and I don't know if Buffalo wanted to wait for him. You know, is this going to be the year he finally plays 60 to 65 games? I don't think they wanted to take that chance. 
Zig, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Uh, let me remind everybody to uh, catch Zig Fercasi on Sirius XM NFL radio. And also uh, he does some work with uh, Sirius XM NHL, uh, but you'll uh, he's dominant over on channel 88 <laughs> on the Sirius XM NFL dial. Uh does great work and you know, the voice uh, you've, you've been, you've heard his voice uh, around these parts for 20 years. And uh, we miss you around here, Zig. Dude, I, I miss, I miss a lot of you guys around there. I was actually up there in July. My uh, nephew and niece got married again. They had a ceremony last year, but because of COVID only if so many people could attend. So they had a big ceremony in downtown Buffalo. In fact, at the hall they had, it was literally right across the street from uh, the ballpark there. So I says, if this wedding goes bad, I can go see the Blue Jays and Orioles. But I never, I never got a chance to get over there to see uh, the Blue Jays and Orioles. But yeah, I was back over the summer. And then for this uh, NCCC alumni thing, I'll be back next year. But uh, I keep in touch. You know, obviously, you, you've been a friend of mine for over 25 years. I see LeBron Steen on Twitter all the time as well. So... Uh, it's always good to be chatting with the folks in Western New York. If memory serves, that uh, Orioles series was when everything became open, you know, because the first couple series, yes. everybody was, and those Orioles tickets were dirt cheap. So <laughs> you would have you would have had no trouble getting a ticket. And I covered oh. those games. The Orioles won one of those games in the ninth inning. I don't know if you're an Orioles fan, but that was a exciting comeback they had. Zig, yeah. what is your baseball team? Are you a Yankees fan? No, gosh. I, what are you? I Well, for years, I was a Cincinnati Reds fan, but since they've got kind of rudderless with their ship, and I see your Cleveland, is that, that, is that now a Guardians hat there, Tim? I think it's always going to be an Indians hat. Ah, okay. All right. All right. Because it All was, right. you know, that's because that's what it was, right? I mean, it's not like when I write about something that happened in Orchard Park in 1980, I have to say it happened at Highmark Stadium, you know, as, as opposed to Rich Stadium. It was it, people that no, it this is, this is an Indian hat. Yeah, I but, thought it was a Clarence Red Devils hat. Yeah, I uh, I was a Reds fan for a lot of years, but uh, unfortunately their ownership um, now they're going on the cheap once again, and you know they keep a guy like Joey Votto around. But the reason I got to be a Reds fan over the years, like I mentioned. Johnny Bench many years ago played for the Buffalo Bisons and because they had uh, the riots up near where War Memorial Stadium was, they had games played in Niagara Falls. Now, I was only like two or three years old, so I don't remember this, but Johnny Bench literally, guys, played six, seven blocks from where I grew up because I grew up on Independence Avenue in the falls and the stadiums on Hyde Park off of um, LaSalle. So it's not even a 15, 20 minute walk to the stadium. So there was that identification. Plus I was a huge Pete Rose fan. And then obviously we know what happened to him later, but then I wound up, Timmy, you remember the old sports fan radio. I was network. just going to ask you about that. I did shows with Pete and I also did updates during his show. So that was a real blast to work with him. So that's where kind of the Reds connection came. Let from. me, well, let me ask you, but you bring that up uh, and, and Zig. So you, this would have been in the nineties, right? 95 yes. to 2000. You're on sports fan radio. And of course I remember you being on there when Pete Rose had a show and he would do it from various locations. He was at MGM grand a lot, but you know, so whatever. Um, I didn't realize you were such a huge fan growing up until you oh, just yeah. now mention it. What was it like working with him? And how was, you know, that old saying is you're not supposed to meet your heroes. What was yeah. your, interaction with him like in a professional setting i had actually interviewed pete gosh back 1984 when i was an intern at wjjl in niagara falls and our mount carmel church men's club drove took a bus down to pittsburgh to see the reds and the pirates in 84 so i was an intern i actually secured a press pass and i remember uh interviewing him and he answered a few of my questions and all of a sudden there was one, I think I got his dander up a little bit and I'm like, you know, scared off a little bit. Years later, when I really met him in person, I told him about that. He started to laugh. He goes, oh, I think I was just testing you then because you were a young guy. But um, when you meet your heroes, you, you find out that they're good people, but they're also maybe a little bit flawed or whatever. 
Um, but he always had that cocky ass grin to him. You, you see, you, are, you always saw it, Timmy, when you're at the plate and all that. He, he always had that confident grin. Um, and I, I always made I made my easiest money off of him one time. I remember he was in town doing the show, and Tennessee I think was playing South Carolina on a Thursday night game. This was when Peyton Manning was still the quarterback at Tennessee. And I go, oh, Pete, you know, you know, because he likes to wager. Let's not kid ourselves here. I says, Pete, you're going to get down on Tennessee. They're going to kill South Carolina. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. The next day I see him at the MGM. I go, Pete, did you get that wager down on Tennessee? Gives me that cocky ass grin that he has. Pulls out a wad of cash like a fist. Flips out a hundred. He says, you give that back to me if they don't cover. Tennessee won by like 50 that night. Easiest money I think I ever made. But uh, he, he was a guy who always had to have an edge to him too. And um, if he had come clean when he admitted he betted on baseball, he'd be in the hall by now. But uh, people still revere him because, Timmy, he played the game the way it should be played, like his life depended on it. He's still, I think, the all-time leading hitter, all-time winningest games and everything like that. So it, it was a blast to meet Pete Rose all in all. and got to As know somebody, I'm sure you followed it every year and all the discussions regarding the Hall of Fame. Uh, and you know, as, as somebody who covers sports as much as you do, the, the, you have your finger on the pulse of just how people feel. Right. Um, what, what do you think? Do you think he gets into the Hall of Fame? I think now the fact that he did ultimately confess. Plus, let's not forget now, Tim, you've got wagering all over the place. You can bet on this stuff now. Now, it still doesn't let you as a player or a manager bet on your own team. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's still forbidden in clubhouses around sports, but I think at some point he ultimately does get in. I think he's paid his penance, and he's still, to me, one of the great ambassadors for the game. So I think at some point he does, hopefully while he's still alive. Yeah, that, that was I was just going to add are. that. I, I, my guess is, is that he'll get in, but they'll wait until after he's dead as kind of like a, to spite him maybe for being, for being arrogant and for lying about it and all that. And for rubbing so many people for making it hard on a lot of people, uh, he'll, they'll probably put him in after he's dead. I'm sorry, Joni, you were saying, I was just gonna say it opposite of maybe where it was 30 years ago when he was banned from baseball, I think it would be good public relations and for the sport to lift the ban and allow him to be in the Hall of Fame. Probably if you poll public opinion, more people would like to see that than Shoeless not. Joe Jackson too. I think a lot I think Shoeless Joe Jackson is uh, has a is a very sympathetic figure nowadays and uh, as as history has uh, history has shown, shown that uh, yeah. he he wasn't uh, as uh, complicit in the, in the Black Sox scandal. Uh, Zig, thanks for doing this. Uh, it's always Anytime, a pleasure to, to talk to you and it's uh, one of the great voices of uh of buffalo broadcasting too always great to hear your voice and i and we hear it on sirius xm nfl on channel 88 but uh it's good to hear you uh talking directly to the folks in in western new york well always a pleasure timmy we've been friends for a long time and keep up uh, what you're doing also the killer work with um the athletic too and jonas keep up the outstanding work with what you do as well brother new bronstein right, time you, new <laughs> there you go hey, we're working on big mergers there you go. Yeah, you know, Jonah, uh, let's uh, take a moment real quick to thank Amherst Pizza and Ale House for sponsoring Tim Graham and Friends. Amherst Pizza and Ale House is at 55 Cross Point Parkway in Getzville. That's right off of Millersport Highway in the 990. You go there and watch all the college and pro football games, basketball, hockey, you name it. Because they have so many TVs, you can go there and watch whatever's going on on the schedule. They also have ESPN Plus there. So uh, if there's a hockey game that uh, you're unable to watch at home or your other establishment doesn't have ESPN Plus and you want to catch the game, well, make sure you to go to Amherst Pizza and Ale House. Recognized by ESPN.com as Western New York's top spot to watch sports. Jonah and I go there quite a bit. You can stop in or call for takeout and delivery, 716-625-7100. One more time, that's 716-625-7100 for, uh, for uh, takeout or delivery. Amherst Pizza and Ale House. Uh, Jonah, uh, before we wrap things up, uh, anything else you want to add? 
Well, no, you mentioned ESPN Plus, and if somebody gets this podcast quick enough and maybe if they're listening on double time and can make it in time, there's a big UB women's game tonight. They're playing against Princeton. That game is on ESPN Plus. UB, as of yesterday, the women were 44 in the NCAA net rankings and Princeton's 40. So UB's in position to maybe be an at-large bid quality team uh, if they win a game like this and, and keep playing as well as they have been. Right on. Yeah, UB women are having a really good run. Um, they beat for, Syracuse. For Felicia Leggett Jacks last season before she joined Syracuse. Could be a memorable one. Could be a, a run in the NCAA tournament. Good win against VCU at the buzzer last week. I mean, this might be the best team she's had in the uh, nine, ten, or I think 11 years that she's been the coach there now. Yeah, that, fan, that, that finish at the end of that game against VCU uh, led off Sports Center. Uh, and play of the week and uh, that sequence uh, in which VCU takes the late lead and then UB with two and a half seconds left uh, finishes it off. Uh, okay, Jonah, uh, we'll talk later in the week. We'll uh, do a little bit more with uh, big four basketball and what's going on with college sports. Uh, working on uh, trying to land an interview with the uh, tough to get Mike McDonald after his milestone victory. How many was it? It's 400th win. 400th collegiate win. And that, that nice career. Canisius, Madai, and Damon. He's won at least yeah. 100 games at all three levels. Well, we'll try to get Mike McDonald on uh, the show here to talk about that, and uh, he's always a great guest to talk about college basketball in general. Now, are uh, we going to have Mike Morano sitting in the fourth corner and not saying anything? Is that how we're <laughs> going to do it? Yeah, uh, the, uh, the assistant AD, Mike Morano, who used to accompany – Mike McDonald into the studio at the radio show and just sit there in the corner like a, like an enforcer. Yeah, like a consigliere. Right. <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody, for listening to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTPK, CPAs and Business Consultants. Uh, and uh, make sure to pop in at uh, Amherst Pizza and Alehouse. Give them some support uh, for being a sponsor of Tim Graham and Friends. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400 or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions.